whistle. It's done. It's over. It is over. Trinidad with nothing to play for has dethroned the United States, knocking them out of the World Cup 2018. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Wiebe. That's not important. This is Landon Donovan, right here, record holder in MLS, U.S. national team. Uh, let's sit down and chat, Landon, and it's not uh, about what maybe we want to talk about right now. I'm going to start with right. the U.S. national team. We all know what happened in Trinidad and Tobago. We know the after effects. This team is not going to Russia. I'm wondering where you watched it, how you experienced it, how you felt after, and how you've kind of come to terms with that failure. Like everyone, I think the last half hour or so, were really disappointing. And the feeling I had after the game was very similar in a lot of ways to the way I felt when I got left off the 2014 team. And, but this felt worse because, at least at that point, you knew the team was still going to the World Cup. You had some context of the big picture and that U.S. soccer was going to keep moving forward positively. In this way, you were just trying to process what it all meant. And what does this actually mean financially, emotionally, spiritually, um, developmentally for Major League Soccer, for U.S. Soccer? So it was a, it felt like a gut punch. I mean, you just felt, you really felt physically ill for quite a few hours after. When you look at the effect that this World Cup or lack thereof for the United States will have on the soccer culture in the U.S., the business of soccer, attracting new fans, what do you mourn? <laughs> it's a good question, and I don't know where the bigger impact is going to get felt. Obviously, they're going to be financial impact. It's, it's impacted all of us personally already in different ways. It's, it's going to impact certainly Major League Soccer. It's going to impact U.S. soccer and their sponsorships and the way things happen going forward. I think probably the bigger loss is the chance to inspire next year. And I'm not a badminton fan right but when I watch the Olympics and the US are playing I'm tuned in like crazy and I'm, I'm pretending like I know what they're doing and I'm you know like why did he hit it there but I care in that moment and there are going to be a number of five to 15 year old boys and girls next summer that are watching the World Cup and are not watching the US and not having that same inspiration from it. And you don't know the impact of that for a long time. And we'll probably never be able to quantify exactly what was lost, but I can promise you there was something lost. Obviously, the legends of this sport in this country have a role to play in the next five years and the long-term future of this sport. What role do former players who had so much at stake and were so involved, what role do you have in advancing this program? What role do you wanna have in the coming years? We all have a responsibility. That's my first point. And, and after the disappointment started to wane, I looked at myself and I said, am I doing enough to help? Because for the last couple of years, I've been a dedicated father and husband and taking care of my family. But am I doing enough in the soccer world to help? And I've dedicated, like most of us, dedicated our whole lives to making this thing better. So I'm asking myself that question as we speak. Am I doing enough and what's the way I can personally have the biggest impact? And I think all of us need to have that same question. Does it mean that everything needs to get thrown out the window and say everything we're doing is wrong? No, but it, it may just be that this is the time where we need to reassess, reevaluate, maybe change is needed in some of the leadership positions and, and maybe um, it's time for us to, to really look at this genuinely and say, what can we do to make it better? And I think it's our obligation as some of the thought leaders in, in this country in soccer to get together and say, what do we do to move this thing forward? This is a transition period for the U.S. Do you think that it's going to be a smooth transition? I do have faith. Um, what, what needs to be developed or what we need to see is who are the next leaders going to be? Is Christian going to be that leader? Is a guy like Weston McKinney going to be a leader in that way? That to me is the bigger question because unless we're doing something really wrong, we're going to get better soccer wise. We, we have to. We're putting too many resources, too many smart people starting to be in these power positions that are technical directors or academy directors or coaches. So we're going to get better. But are we developing enough leaders so that when it's 2-1 in Trinidad and there's 30 minutes to go, we have eight guys on the field who say, 
uh-uh, this ain't happening, not on my watch and not today. And, and that's what we need to figure out. One, if we have, if not, how do we develop them and how do we, how do we nurture that? Galaxy have numbers four now, five in the attack, back for Donovan. Donovan shot, and he scored it! Landon Donovan is back! Change the graphic, he's got another goal. That didn't take long. Let's talk MLS. You came back last year. Do you have an itch still where you want to be on the field this time of year? I do not have an itch. <laughs> um, when, when I get in the stadiums, I feel I'm excited because it's such a part of my life. So you, you think to yourself, God, I'd love to be on the field. But um, if I can't chase my 20-month-old, I can't, I can't chase Nacho Piatti around the field. So I'm very aware of that. And I kind of felt this way in the last few years of my career. What's next and how do you make an impact? Because I'm not going to run around and score 15 goals anymore. Um, certainly not now. I'm not going to step <laughs> back on the field and do any of that. Yeah. So how can you make an impact? And it goes back to what we were talking about with the national team. What's the best way for U.S. soccer as a whole? How can I make the biggest impact? And that's something I'm exploring right now. Galaxy have to do some sharing now. L.A. is big enough for two teams, LAFC coming in 2018. Yeah. Uh, what effect does that have on the Galaxy? What effect does that have on the soccer market that is L.A.? First of all, John Thornton's done a tremendous job so far with, with what he's done and what they've built. And all of their front office and Tom Penn and the ownership group, I think, have done a really good job. And they're making real strides in, in that market now. Does it carry over? Do people show up to the games? What kind of team? I mean, they still don't have a team, yeah. and we're a few months out, so that's Bob Bradley's charge, obviously. But when you bring in a guy like Bob Bradley, you're making a very clear statement that we're serious about the soccer side, too. So I think for the Galaxy, it's, uh, it's in the end, it's going to be a good thing. Just like NYCFC elevated the Red Bulls in every way, I think the same will happen between LAFC and the Galaxy. The age of expansion has been one that you've watched from a very intimate perspective. You've seen it go from 10 to 22 and will keep growing bigger and bigger from that point of view. How has this era changed Major League Soccer? Well, one, it's more exciting, right? Because going to new stadiums and new teams and new cities, that's, we really enjoyed that. There's been such an increase in spending, both through the CBA and then on top of that with TAM and GAM and other, other initiatives by the league that they've been able to keep pace with the expansion. So now, just by way of example, when I came back last year, my first game was against Orlando at home. I couldn't believe how much better the league had gotten in every way. And it was part of it was because I was still so slow and <laughs> trying to get my way back. But as much as we want this thing to get better overnight, everyone can take a step back and say, you know what, we're, we're doing something right because the product has gotten a lot better. What's your favorite team to watch? Who's your favorite player to watch? I love watching guys that have been around a long time and still do it. So when I see, as much as it killed me to watch the ball go in, when I see Kyle Beckerman score in L.A. when they're down a man, that's like, I know, I know Kyle since I was 16. So it, it feels good emotionally to watch that. But there are so many players now. You know, Jordi Reyna is fun to watch. Watching Freddie Montero come back into the league and how he's played, watching Victor Vasquez. Obviously, Giovinco is just, he's special and he's mm -hmm. electric. Um, it's an exciting time to be a fan and and honestly selfishly I wish I'd played with or against some of these guys because I want to see them up close and um, I think there's more talent in that way than there ever has been. Miguel Miron is a name I hear every time I talk to former players, current <laughs> players. When you look at him in particular but also Atlanta United as a whole it feels like they've upped the ante across the board. What do you see in that franchise? I mean what, what more can you say but it starts with the top right so Arthur Blank from the beginning said, if I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do it right. And just like everything he's done in his life and his career, there's a reason why he's successful. Their training facility, what their stadium looks like, their fan base, and now their team, right? So it's it's not a coincidence that all those things have fallen in the line. Almiron is is really special. But for me, the most, Im the most impressive thing about him is he's tenacious and you can see you can see it all mean something to him. And that, for me, is the biggest thing because talent-wise, he's, you know, he's miles ahead of a lot of the guys, but when you add that in, that's when you get a world-class player, and I think he's really special. Amir Arguetta!